August 23rd, 1999. Biography with Harry Smith. Dorothy Dandridge seemed to have it all. Beauty, talent, and steamy sex appeal. But all that did not open the doors to Hollywood. She had to knock them down herself. She performed in hotels where she was not allowed to spend the night. And she turned down stereotypical black roles. Her struggle for acceptance in white Hollywood would pave the way for many to follow. But the uphill battle of her career would soon take its toll on her personal life. When Dorothy was asked about racial prejudice, she replied, It is such a waste. It makes you half alive. It gives you nothing. It takes away. Oh, pardon me, boy. Yes, yes. Is that the Chattanooga choo-choo? That's the Chattanooga choo-choo. Oh, on track 29. 29. Uh-huh. That's on the Tennessee line. When you think of Dorothy Dandridge, think of her beauty, her personality, and she was a good actress. With a combination of all these things, made her in the class all by herself. Get out of the way you belong. It's just what I'm doing. I heard about Dorothy when I was 19 years old. I heard about Carmen Jones, and I wanted to know who this woman was and how could she be so beautiful and be so talented, and I didn't know who she was. One didn't know Dorothy. Off that screen, she was sort of like smoke. She was Hollywood's first African-American dramatic female movie star. She was a powerful force on the stage and screen, whose talent and international appeal garnered her unprecedented popularity and even a Best Actress Oscar nomination. But although she was beautiful and sophisticated, Dorothy Dandridge was a study in contradictions. Plagued with self-doubt and bent on self-destruction, hers was a turbulent and tragic life. She should be the most successful movie star in the world. But she was a black woman at uh, the wrong time. In the summer of 1922, in the comfortable colored section of Cleveland, Ohio, a pregnant 23-year-old housewife named Ruby Dandridge abandoned her mild-mannered husband, Cyril. Ruby Dandridge was very outgoing, very ambitious, very aggressive woman. And Cyril Dandridge was basically a quiet man, rather introverted, uh, easygoing. And the two of them, for some reason, they hit it off and they, they married, but it was not a happy marriage. Taking their 15-month-old daughter Vivian, Ruby secretly settled in a nearby but poor neighborhood. And on November 9th, 1922, Dorothy Jean Dandridge was born at Cleveland City Hospital. Over the next few months, Ruby moved frequently within the black community to avoid Cyril, who was determined to locate his daughters. Dorothy missed a father relationship. Her mother would tell her terrible things about the father. She said that the father didn't want them, that he had kicked them out of the house, and that... Uh, he was partial to his mother. Ruby soon found employment as a maid and devoted her free time to her real passion, becoming an entertainer. She found an audience at her local church where she sang and recited poetry for the congregation. By the time Dorothy was four, she and her six-year-old sister Vivian were also performing at Sunday services. Ruby struck up an intense friendship with a talented musician, Geneva Williams, and invited her to move in with her and her daughters. It was a sexual relationship between Ruby and Neva. Neither one ever, I don't believe, used the word lesbian. I, don't, I just don't think they did. Um, I, think that by the, I think as little girls they noticed a lot between the two women. Ruby took on the role of breadwinner, and Neva was given full charge of the children's daily regime of singing, dancing, and acrobatic lessons, as well as their discipline. The two of them would, would talk at night, and, and one would say, you know, well, we, you know, we didn't get a spanking today, and the other would say, the day's not over. Under Neva's skillful coaching, within a year, Dorothy and Vivian were touring the South, billed as the Wonder Children. And soon they were earning enough money to support the entire family. 
Dorothy's beauty and beguiling manner made her a particular crowd pleaser. But life on the road was hard on the girls, and Dorothy began to develop a fear of live performances. Her lack of proper education only added to her growing anxiety and insecurity. Dorothy didn't stay in school long enough because she worked and would interrupt her schooling. She fooled everybody. She couldn't read for a long time. She memorized everything. When the stock market crash of 1929 ushered in the Great Depression, black communities across America were hit hard and the Wonder Children were forced into early retirement. But for Ruby Dandridge, it was simply a minor setback. In 1929, William Fox Studios released Hearts and Dixie, the first Hollywood musical film to feature an all-black cast. And Ruby was convinced that there would be more work for talented black performers. With Neva by her side, Ruby Dandridge packed up her family and boarded a bus for Hollywood. They got to Los Angeles, this land of sunshine, and the place where America's mass dreams were merchandised, and, and got into um, movie circles and, and learned the ropes. When landing a movie role for the girls was not as easy as they had hoped, Ruby and Neva teamed Dorothy and Vivian with a young neighbor, Etta Jones, whom they had met at a dance class. The trio was billed as the Dandridge Sisters, and their melodic three-part harmony and youthful exuberance got them noticed. By 1935, the Dandridge Sisters were singing and dancing in films such as the big broadcast of 1936 with Bill Bojangles Robinson, A Day at the Races with the Marx Brothers, and in It Can't Last Forever with the Jackson Brothers. Once again, Dorothy was a standout. In 1938, the Dandridge sisters earned a coveted booking at New York's famous Cotton Club. Groomed to appeal to an older audience, the three glamorous divas opened to rave reviews. The Dandridge sisters had a very mellow sound. Uh, Dorothy sang lead. Dorothy usually was, was in the middle. They really were, in a sense, precursors to the Supremes. It was a good act. Also booked at the Cotton Club were the Nicholas Brothers. The phenomenal song and dance team was young, handsome, and hugely famous. And both brothers took a special interest in the stunning 15-year-old Dorothy. All of a sudden, I see these three lovely girls come into the club. And my brother and I looked at each other and said, Did you see what I see? <laughs> I said, Yes, I do. I said, They were all lovely. But my brother and I had our eyes on Dorothy Dandridge. She was beautiful. Just beautiful. We used to not go out a lot and get... Well, not too much because she was restricted a little bit. We had a thing for each other, I must say. Right from the beginning. Harold Nicholas was only 17 and already a show business veteran as well as a notorious ladies' man when he and Dorothy met. But Dorothy had little time for romance as her 12 years of hard work were now paying off. In May of 1939, the Dandridge sisters, with Neva as their chaperone, sailed to London for an engagement at the famous Palladium, and they dazzled a sophisticated European audience. But by now, Dorothy was becoming worn down by the stress of live performances, as well as by Neva's overbearingly harsh rules, which included taping down the 16-year-old's breasts to conceal her now shapely figure. Neva felt threatened by Dorothy's burgeoning sexuality, and she became obsessed with the matter of Dorothy's virginity. Dorothy had come home, and Neva was suspicious and wanted to examine her. It really was the equivalent of, of, of a rape. Geneva threw her down on the bed, and Dottie got up and gave her a good punch. She 
knocked her on the floor at one point, and that finished the physical abuse. Finally standing up for herself and declaring her independence from the woman who had been her mother's live-in lover, Dorothy was empowered for the first time in her life. Upon returning to the United States, the blossoming teenager decided it was time to go solo, and not just as a singer, but as an actress. In 1940, she won a role in the highly successful Los Angeles stage production of Meet the People. It was basically a white show, a white review, and very forward-looking. The thing that's so interesting about this is that in the very early 40s, just her particular vision, that she didn't see this as a review that an African-American woman should not audition for. It really was knocking down a barrier. Dorothy's budding acting career effectively dissolved the Dandridge sisters' trio. But Ruby and Neva were content as long as she continued to financially support the family. The attractive, aspiring actress earned a small part as a servant girl in her first major Hollywood film, The Lady from Louisiana, starring John Wayne. But her biggest break came in 1941, in Sun Valley Serenade, a big-budget film from 20th Century Fox, starring Sonia Henney, Milton Berle, and the Nicholas Brothers. Harold Nicholas, now engaged to Dorothy, convinced studio executives that the lovely singer could add both talent and sex appeal to their big song and dance number. Oh, pardon me, boy. Yes, yes. Is that the Chattanooga choo-choo? That's the Chattanooga choo-choo. Oh, 29. 29. Uh-huh. That's on the Tennessee line. She said the Tennessee line. Check. She means that she can't afford. I can't afford to board a Chattanooga choo-choo. Have you got in there? This was the first time that we ever had a female to perform with us. And she looked good performing with us. And we loved it. By the tender age of 18, it seemed as if all Dorothy Dandridge's dreams were about to come true. But even a talented young performer like Dorothy couldn't predict the lofty heights she would scale and the price she would have to pay for stardom. You're watching Dorothy Dandridge on Biography. Dorothy Dandridge continues here on Biography. By 1941, Dorothy's career was taking off. She had established herself as a dynamic new musical performer, appearing in several low-budget movies and starring in a series of soundies. These short musical films, which exploited Dorothy's obvious physical assets, were shown on jukeboxes equipped with tiny screens. And they were the forerunners to today's music videos. Singing his cowboy song, he's just too much. He's got a knocked out western accent with a Harlem touch. He was raised on local beat. He's what you call a swing half breed. Singing his cow cow, he's a strange. Now confident in her career, Dorothy was ready to set a wedding date with her longtime boyfriend, Harold Nicholas. On September 6th, 1942, just eight weeks shy of her 20th birthday, Dorothy and Harold were wed. But married life was not as blissful as Dorothy had hoped. He always had his golf clubs with him, and that was almost like his first love. Dorothy said to me, your brother thinks more of golf than he does of me. Dorothy soon found herself vying for Harold's attention and discovered that golf was not the only thing that kept her husband away from home. I chased the ladies quite a bit myself, you know. I think I was too young to be married, really, at that age. I think that was, you know, my trouble. Dorothy spent most of her free time with her sister-in-law and best friend, Geraldine Pate Nicholas, a beautiful, educated woman with a lively sense of humor. 
we were good friends from the start. She realized that I wished her well. She was just sweet and generous and lovely. In 1942, the up-and-coming actress won minor roles in such films as Lucky Jordan, Drums of the Congo, and Hit Parade of 1943. But the only role that really interested her was that of wife and mother. When the newlywed learned she was pregnant, she believed her prayers had been answered. Dorothy was willing to give up her career. Certainly she would have uh, been happy to just be a housewife and raise her children. On September 1st, 1943, in her ninth month of pregnancy, Dorothy began experiencing severe labor pains. Believing this to be just another false alarm, Harold left his wife with Geraldine and went off to play a round of golf. For hours, Jerry heeded her friend's agonized pleas to wait for her husband's return until she finally took matters into her own hands. We had to go in the neighborhood to find a car, and we finally found one after an hour or so and took, got her to the hospital. But it was rather late, and the baby had already started coming. The following day, Harolyn Suzanne Nicholas was born. Baby Lynn was the center of her parents' universe and brought domestic contentment to the Nicholas household. But by the time Lynn was two, it was clear to everyone that the toddler was not developing or behaving like a normal child. She was so very troubled. She had tantrums. She didn't know who her father was, her mother. She couldn't recognize relationships. Harold couldn't cope with it. Detached and withdrawn, Harold left Dorothy to search for answers to their daughter's mysterious condition alone. It was hard on her, being there with the kid by herself. Dorothy was going to all types of doctors and things, you know. So it, it was pretty rough. When doctors determined that Lynn was permanently retarded due to a lack of oxygen to the brain at birth, Dorothy was devastated. The nagging guilt and her rapidly deteriorating marriage led her to psychiatric counseling and a growing dependency on prescription sedatives. She wasn't getting along with Harold, and she couldn't tolerate his staying out for a couple of days or so, and she uh, just took too many pills. And we had to take her to the hospital, and they, they uh, pumped her stomach, and the next day she was okay. Dorothy denied the overdose was an attempt at suicide and instead blamed it on carelessness. But when she was found several more times in a dangerously over-medicated state, it was clear that her poised exterior was hiding an emotionally crippled soul. With her daughter's illness no longer a mystery, Dorothy was forced to face the fact that her marriage to Harold Nicholas was a failure. After a seven-year union, Dorothy asked Harold for a divorce. I take the blame for it because I was not man enough to stand up, and, you know, and I wanted to be, I wanted to be a man too young. The financing of Lynn's care became her mother's total responsibility. The six-year-old needed round-the-clock supervision, and Dorothy had no choice but to find a full-time caregiver for Lynn to live with. Such a necessity was expensive. So Dorothy concentrated on advancing her career. In 1948, she became one of the first black students at the Actors Lab in Los Angeles. And she flourished in the creative, liberal environment where she honed her craft and became friends with other aspiring actors like Anthony Quinn. But when Dorothy danced with Quinn at an Actors Lab benefit, a scandal sprang out of their innocent interracial frolic. Powerful Hollywood columnist Hedda Hopper reported in the L.A. Times that the community was shocked at the sight of dancing between whites and Negroes where one and all could see. Disgusted and defiant, Dorothy's response to the racial slur was printed in the California Eagle. 
The 25-year-old was applauded by civil-minded blacks in Hollywood and emerged a symbol of dignity and humanity. After the Second World War, Hollywood finally realized that, um, that, that race was an issue in American life. Now the, the black character in the Hollywood film was the central character, serious, brooding, or bruised. The question of race was being brought front and center. But although Hollywood was making major strides with films like Pinky and No Way Out, roles for black actors were still few and far between. Dorothy had no choice but to return to the nightclub circuit, and she hired composer Phil Moore, whom she knew from her Cotton Club days, to coach her. He helped her create this act. He arranged and composed for her, and he went over with her almost every detail, from makeup to hairstyle to what she wore. He liked her in what he called these snaky dresses, very clinging, form-fitting dresses. He liked seeing himself as her Svengali. Phil Moore transformed Dorothy Dandridge from a fresh-faced beauty into a sensuous chanteuse. Before long, the two became lovers and began sharing a pleasant domestic life. But despite sold-out appearances and rave reviews, Dorothy was once again suffering from paralyzing stage fright, and she desperately wanted to return to the screen. In 1950, the 28-year-old actress accepted a role as an African queen in Tarzan's Peril, opposite Lex Barker. When the Hollywood Censorship Bureau voiced loud objections to the film's blatant sexuality, Dorothy got noticed. The resulting publicity landed her on the April 1951 cover of Ebony Magazine. She also graced the pages of all white publications, including Look and Life. It was apparent to all that Dandridge's charisma had crossover appeal to black and white audiences alike. And Phil Moore had no trouble booking Dorothy at the chic, all-white Café Gala in Los Angeles and at the exclusive Café de Paris in London. MCA, one of Hollywood's most powerful talent agencies, signed Dandridge as a client and booked her in a series of successful television appearances, including Ed Sullivan's Toast of the Town. Dorothy Dandridge was reaching heights no other African-American actress had reached before. But there were still more boundaries to cross and new barriers to break. That's a good thing. Here I stand again, about to beat the band again. Feeling grand again. In 1952, Dorothy Dandridge's celebrated club act led to her first starring role in a major Hollywood film, directed by Louis B. Mayer's nephew, Gerald Mayer. But there is another Dorothy Dandridge you haven't seen until now, a wonderful, emotional actress. I'm Dorothy Dandridge. I play the role of the teacher. This was my first day, and I wasn't sure how it was all going to work out. MGM cast the 30-year-old in Bright Road, opposite handsome newcomer Harry Belafonte. The film featured a predominantly all-black cast, and Dorothy portrayed a small-town school teacher reaching out to a troubled student. She was absolutely beautiful in a, such a classy way. She was perfect. She came prepared. She never blew up under any circumstances. She dealt well with the crew with the kids in the class, with the director. Dorothy was entranced by the gentle, well-educated director. Not only did she earn his respect, she also won his affection. There was an engaging quality to her. She was easy to talk to. It was a relationship which I will always remember because it was, it was really quite wonderful. 
But although Bright Road opened to a weak box office, Dorothy was at the top of her game as an entertainer and was headlining at the Last Frontier Hotel in Las Vegas. In the 1950s, Las Vegas was a segregated town, and black performers were barred from residing in the hotels or using public elevators and dining rooms. Vegas was a very interesting situation there for any black performer. It didn't matter how famous you were, how big your salary was. There was a very, very sharp line drawn about where you could and could not go. When the popular songstress demanded a room, the last frontier temporarily lifted its ban on black guests. But when Dandridge threatened to use the swimming pool, hotel management discovered an immediate need to drain it for repairs. So this was what she was confronted with. She went out on stage, and she was a goddess. And then when the performance was over, it was back doors, freight elevators, or in this case, it was the thing of um, not using a swimming pool. While in Las Vegas, Dorothy became romantically involved with a handsome young actor named Peter Lawford. But their interracial love affair was doomed from the start. She was very fond of him. But he told her in no uncertain terms that he didn't have any big trust fund. He was totally dependent on what work he got with the rat pack and people like this. And that they could not marry because he could not work, nor could she. Though she was loved and admired by thousands of fans, Dorothy's self-esteem was crumbling from a string of failed romances. Lonely and depressed, she turned once again to alcohol and prescription drugs. But as before, work provided the distraction that Dorothy so desperately needed. In 1953, Hollywood was buzzing with news of a big screen production of Carmen Jones, the all-black film adaptation of Bizet's classic opera. Dorothy knew the coveted title role was a star maker, but the film's notoriously tyrannical director, Otto Preminger, wouldn't even consider her for the part. But with dogged determination, the 31-year-old actress engineered an interview with the otherwise disinterested director. He looked at her and he said to her that every time he saw her, it was Saks Fifth Avenue, and he didn't really see this earthy Carmen. Dandridge was angry. She had to get this part. She went to Max Factors, the great makeup place in California, and worked on a new look for her hair, the tousled dark, dark hair, darker eye makeup, the mouth even more sensuous. It said that when she walked in, Preminger said, it's Carmen. Once again co-starred with Harry Belafonte, Dorothy played a tempestuous femme fatale who seduces and ultimately destroys both herself and her lover. Although Dandridge and Belafonte were both accomplished singers, their voices were dubbed by trained operatic vocalists. Nevertheless, nothing could detract from Dandridge's mesmerizing and sensual performance. When your lover decides to fly, there ain't no door that you can close. She just picks you a quick goodbye and flicks the salt from a tail and goes. If you listen, then you'll get taught. And here's your lesson for today. If I chase you, then you'll get caught. And once I got you, I go my way. Dandridge's and Belafonte's sizzling performances were destined to make them America's first black sex symbols. Don't you trust yourself? Also featured in the cast were Pearl Bailey and fresh-faced newcomer Diane Carroll. I met Dorothy Dandridge during Carmen Jones. I sat there, I watched her. I watched her find her art in front of the camera. And that's quite a privileged position, I, I believe. Why don't you tell me? You think what you want. I don't account to no man. You're counting to me. I love you. That gives that me the give right That'll give you to... no right to own me. There's only one that does. That's me. 
myself. Carmen Jones opened on October 28, 1954, and was a smashing critical and financial success. Dorothy Dandridge became a bona fide movie star overnight, and her unforgettable performance earned her the distinction of being the first black woman to grace the cover of Life magazine. Yet nothing would compare to the pride she felt when she learned of her nomination for an Academy Award for Best Actress, making her the first African-American to be nominated for a leading role. At the Academy Awards ceremony on March 30th, 1955, Dorothy shared the Best Actress nomination with such luminaries as Grace Kelly, Judy Garland, Jane Wyman, and Audrey Hepburn. But although the Oscar went to Grace Kelly for her role in The Country Girl, to her fans, Dorothy was a winner and a permanent part of American history. I never thought about whether she'd win or not. I would have loved it had she won because I, I, she, her work was quite extraordinary. But um, it was an important nomination and we all felt long overdue. At the age of 32, Dorothy Dandridge had earned the respect of her peers and public acclaim far in excess of her dreams. But the love and emotional stability she ached for remained just beyond her grasp. In 1955, Dorothy's Academy Award nomination catapulted her to a new level of celebrity, and her exclusive engagements were now earning her up to $3,500 a week in clubs like the Empire Room in New York's Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Dorothy was also in the midst of an intense love affair with Carmen Jones' director, Otto Preminger. Although Preminger was separated from his wife, he was still a legally married man. But Dorothy hoped that this time, things would work out in her favor. He was wonderful to her. He was controlling. He took over her life for a time, he insisted that she only wear beige and white. They'd go to Europe together. He felt freer in Europe. He was afraid of his position in, in the film industry. He would have had trouble with uh, any out-and-out -out relationship. The dictatorial Preminger insisted Dorothy accept only starring roles, forcing her to turn down offer after offer, until eventually her phone stopped ringing. At 33, Dorothy was disenchanted and depressed, and knew she had to face the fact that Otto would never divorce and marry her. After a two-year affair, she abruptly ended the relationship. By 1956, it had been nearly three years since Dorothy had had any significant film work. Desperate, she accepted a supporting role in Island in the Sun, an interracial love story starring Harry Belafonte and Joan Fontaine. Dorothy played a local shop clerk opposite John Justin, and the two shared a full-fledged on-screen love affair. How long would it take you to pack? But I... Two hours. I don't have very much either. There's a plane leaves for England on Friday. I'll send a car for you. All right. You don't seem very surprised. But I'll go into England together. Where you go, I go. The movie was, was fraught with, with compromises, the script. I mean, they didn't want the actor to say that he loved her. You know I'm in love with you, don't you? didn't want him to kiss her. There were some changes made, but the two still weren't permitted to kiss. But despite the controversy, Island in the Sun was a smash hit. Dorothy next starred in Tamango, opposite Kurt Jurgens. The film's underlying story of interracial romance carried over into a real-life affair between the two stars. Once again, Dorothy sought validation through a relationship with an older white man. And as she had done so many times before, she chose to ignore the fact that her lover was married. Dorothy reached out to find love and acceptance in all the wrong places. She never was fulfilled and never really valued herself and never valued her life. In 1957,
1958, Samuel Goldwyn was producing a big-budget film of Porgy and Bess. But many in the black community felt that even Gershwin's music couldn't overshadow the movie's negative stereotyping that they had fought so hard to overcome. Dorothy, who had not had a starring role in the four years since Carmen Jones, signed on to play Bess for $75,000. Part of our community thought that she was selling out. It's just a shame that Hollywood created this beautiful, glamorous, talented movie star, but then didn't know what to do with her. It was already a tense set when the film's director was fired and replaced with Dorothy's rejected lover, Otto Preminger. He was a great director, but he was simply brutal. And Dorothy was this delicate, beauty and she was delicate in temperament nothing she did was was right with him and he would stop her and stop her until she didn't know her lies i mean until she really could not function depressed and exhausted dorothy dreamed of a life out of the spotlight and turned her attention to jack dennison a white former maitre d'hotel who had been pursuing her for years he looked like a Greek god, and she worshipped beauty. I didn't like Mr. Dennison, didn't like what he was about. He was a very cruel person, and uh, she was a masochist, pure and simple. Against the advice of her friends, Dorothy married Jack on June 22, 1959. But any illusions the actress had about retiring were quickly shattered on her honeymoon night. Jack confessed he was deeply in debt, and in order to save his nightclub, which Dorothy had heavily financed, he expected his new bride to perform there. The next day, they flew to New York for the premiere of Porgy and Bess, which, as the cast had feared, drew mixed reviews. Dorothy soon found herself singing at Jack's club. The experience was a sad and humiliating come down for the struggling actress. The couple began to fight bitterly, and Dorothy added vodka to her daily regime of champagne and pills. Dennison just seems to have been a mistake from the very beginning. The man physically abused her, and a man who appears to have been totally insensitive to her, and a man who really sent her into financial ruin. After a tumultuous three-year marriage, Dorothy filed for divorce on grounds of extreme cruelty. Now 40, Dandridge found herself alone, in debt, and behind on her mortgage. She was once again in a downward emotional spiral, and the effects of drugs and alcohol loosened her already tenuous grip on reality. On April 24th, 1963, a humiliated Dorothy Dandridge was caught by photographers when she appeared in bankruptcy court. I could have saved her foreclosure just like that. No problem. But we knew that she was going to be foreclosed on maybe two hours before. You can't do anything then. But what troubled the actress most was that she could no longer afford her daughter's expensive, full-time private care. Lynn was now a 19-year-old woman with the mental capacity of a child. And Dorothy's inability to care for her forced her to make Lynn a ward of the state of California. Dorothy Dandridge, once a symbol of hope and achievement for millions of African Americans, had lost practically everything she ever worked for, and she was about to face her darkest hour alone. You're watching Dorothy Dandridge on Biography. You're watching Biography here on A&E. Now 41, Dorothy Dandridge was broke and living in a rented apartment in West Hollywood. With little work to keep her busy and a crippling dependency on alcohol, prescription drugs, and antidepressants, Dandridge was spending her days depressed and in seclusion, and her nights on the phone with old friends Jerry Nicholas Brenton, Pearl Bailey, and Abby Mann. She used liquor like a medicine to sort of ease the pain. She was very disturbed at times about her daughter who was retarded. She accepted it intellectually, but she never accepted it emotionally, I know. 
She always felt a great deal of guilt about it. That was a tragedy. She was a young woman who had demons. I think she was very much manic depressive. And today, that's very treatable. Back then, it was taboo. You were crazy. You'd, you'd be put in some institution somewhere. And I think she struggled with that along with a real sense of self-hatred. After years of destructive behavior, Dorothy was determined to pull herself together. She began an exhausting routine of exercise and vocal training and called on an old colleague, Earl Mills, to manage her comeback. By 1965, it appeared that Dandridge was finally conquering her demons. She got an advance to write her autobiography, signed a two-picture deal with an independent production company, and gave a hit concert in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the first of three bookings arranged by Mills. Things were looking up, and Dorothy seemed excited about an upcoming engagement at New York's Basin Street East. Dorothy asked Mills to delay picking her up for the airport so she could get some rest. But Mills became anxious when Dorothy failed to answer any of his subsequent phone calls. When he arrived at her apartment, she didn't answer the door. Realizing it was locked from the inside, Mills panicked and broke in using a crowbar. And there he found Dorothy Dandridge lying dead on her bathroom floor. On September 8, 1965, 42-year-old Dorothy Dandridge died from a fatal overdose of Tofranil, her antidepressant. I think that it was a combination of accident and will not to live any longer. She was saying things that let me know that she was going to leave us. She have said, Jerry, now I know you're going to understand. Don't be shocked at anything that happens. But I am tired. And she left notes everywhere in the house. Earl Mills found a note 